Welcome again, everyone. We're very happy to start the conference and this morning session with uh, Mikhail Kofano from Columbia University, who is going to give uh, a series of special lectures on universal construction, construction foams, and link homology. So it's a pleasure. Um, uh, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Hisham. It's a pleasure to be here for the first time. Um, I thank you, Hisham, for inviting us to this exciting event. Um, and let, let us thank Hisham and um, everybody else who organized this conference for, putting, for bringing us together. Um, if it's going to be hard for you to see what I write, please come closer and sit in the front rows. So, so I'll tell you um, the story of the, um, so it's three lectures. Um, so I'll tell you about several structures interrelated that are forms, in, in a certain sense, that relate to link homology. Talk about universal construction and their applications in representation theory and topological theories. So I'm going to start with um, a special case of forms called SL3 forms. Um, so so I'll, I'll give you the motivation later, but for now, uh, uh, I'll define the notion of form. So form is a combinatorial. Is that? Um, so combinatorial two-dimensional CW complex F embedded in three space in R3. So you should think of it as being purely combinatorial. And a form has points of three types, regular points, where a neighborhood of the point looks like an area of the plane, like a disk. It has seams, seam points, where a neighborhood looks like um, a triple of three half planes joined together along the line. And it has vertices, so singular vertices. And the neighborhood of the vertex looks like, looks like this. It's, it consists of a So this is a vertex. You see a vertex has three seams going into it. And there are, six, there are six corners or six parts of facets going into a vertex. So these are the local structures of singularities that we allow. So it's very, very I mean, you, you, if, you, if you're familiar with the three-dimensional topology, then locally this looks like a spine of the three manifold. So you can take a triangulation of the three manifold, take the Poincare dual decomposition, and then the, the, the two skeletons of this decomposition has singularities that look exactly like this. But for us, our forms are embedded in R3. Um, so we're going to, so maybe I'll give you an example. So just a surface embedded in R3 is a form. Another example is uh, what they call a theta form, which consists of three disks uh, glued together along a single seam. So there's a single seam, seam a circle with three disks at it. And another example is start with a torus, standardly embedded in the free space, and add a meridional disk, and add a glue in a meridional disk, and glue in on the outside a longitudinal disk. And this form has a singular, has a vertex, all this form. So these are examples of forms. Uh, so we would like to take forms and assign to them some algebraic information, some algebraic invariant to the form F. We want to assign bracket of F. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be an element of some community ring. And specifically, we're going to work over a field of characteristic two, uh, so it could be just F2. And the, this um, invariant will lie in the, in the ring of, in the following ring. So we can take polynomials in variables x1, x2, x3 in K. And inside, And inside, we can take the subring of symmetric functions, k, e1, e2, e3, which is the same as k, x1, x2, x3, 
the invariant par part under the action of the symmetric group by permutations of the indices. Uh, we'll call this ring R and this big ring R prime. So to define this invariant, let me first talk about admissible colorings or tight colorings of forms. So, so the collection of seams and vertices constitutes the singular graph, SF, singular graph or singular set. So for the first example, the single graph is empty. There is nothing singular. In the second case, the single graph is a circle. In the third case, the singular graph is a bouquet of two circles. So a single graph is always a, a graph of valency four, but it might have loops, and it might have circles which have no vertices. And the connected components of the complement, f minus s of f, I'll just say connected components. Connected components of that are called facets. So this, <coughs> in this example, there's one facet. This form has three facets, and this form has three facets. So let us now define a <coughs> tight coloring uh, C in the set of admissible or tight colorings of the form F. Um, C is a map from the, let me see, let me call connected components, of facets call it F of F, that's a set um, of facets. So define a coloring C to be a map from facets of the form into a three element set, one, two, three. So we color facets by numbers from one to three, subject to the condition that at every seam, the three colors of the three facets of the seam are distinct. It's, that's the tight color. So it's called admissible or tight coloring of the form. So color colors are distinct. So for instance, this, this form has three tight colorings. You can color this component by any color i. Here you have six colorings. This could be any color i1. And any other color I2, I3, so that's six colorings. And this has no colorings because, for instance, along the seam you have the same facet which comes at it from two directions. So if you, if you draw, if you draw a slice of this um, form, you'll see that you, you have a loop at the seam. So it means this, this you have to have the same color. So there are no, no tight colorings. Um, but if you if you pass to a more general form where you put some several several parallel um, several parallel um, meridians and several parallel longitudes and add the disks, then at least for even number of the disks, then you have you'll have plenty of colorings. So so this is the notion of tight colorings and atom of F is the um, set of admissible colorings. So the symmetric group S3 acts on the set of admissible colorings by permuting the colors. Uh, so here is a curious fact. Um, define F, I, J, F, C. Yeah. So it's, I know, it might be hard to, hard to read, but, when, hard to read, yeah, but also, yeah, a big, bigger. Um, define FIGFC to be the union, union of I and J colored facets. Uh, so we're picking two colors out of three, uh, and we have a claim proposition: F I J F C is an orientable. Closed surface in R3. So form lies in R3. So why is that? Well, along along a seam, if you pick in two colors out of three, you have a surface 
along the scene. What happens at the, at the vertex of the foam? Vertex. Um, so let's say the colors are one and two, for instance. Then this facet is adjacent to both, so it must have the third color, three. And this facet is adjacent to both one and two, so it must have the third color, three. Then this facet is adjacent to two and three, so it's one. And this one, the bottom one, is two adjacent to one and three. So if you take a link of the vertex, you see this complete graph on four vertices as the link the link of the vertex, and the colorings of um, so facets correspond to edges of this graph. So coloring of facets corresponds to coloring of edges. But up to permutations of colors, there is only one way to, to admissibly color this graph. So with every vertex, the three colors are distinct. Um, that's this way, up to permutation of indices. Now you see if you take two colors out of three, for instance, if you take F13, F13, of C, then you see a plane. So at, at the single point, it's a, it's a surface. And likewise, if you take colors one and two, one, two, one, two, it's, it's a surface. And for, for um, a two, three, you can also see it from this picture because if you're choosing two colors out of three, you get, so for instance, if you take colors one, three, three, one, three, one, you get a circle and you're taking a cone of the circle to see the neighborhood of the point in F. One three of C, and so that's the surface. So, so the proposition follows. So we get the surface in this way, and it's it's orientable because it's a, it's a closed surface. There's no boundary embedded in R three. So it's orientable. In particular, it has even order characteristic. Chi f i j of C is in two Z. We'll use that. Uh, so for example, for for instance, for the example two here, no matter what the coloring is, any surface Fij for that coloring is a two sphere. On the other hand, if you color this by color, say okay two, then F12 of this form S is S. That's union of s, it's called one or two, that says. But F13 of s is the empty surface. There is nothing colored by one or three. So, so let us, so in this way for any C, we get three surfaces, F12, F13, F23, they all have even order characteristics and also to, when we're computing this invariant, it's going to be convenient to extend forms and allow dots to float on facets. Dots are like observables. I don't know this word from talking to physicists. It's an observable, so it can float on a facet. And if you have several dots uh, floating on a facet, you can just draw them as a single dot with the weight three or whatever the number of dots is. So dot n. So we'll, 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 our forms are enhanced, possibly enhanced with these dots. So now let us define the evaluation of the form. And for the evaluation, we need a coloring. So a form with a coloring C. By definition, the evaluation is as follows. We take, um, we take variable x1 and we look at the, um, so the coloring is fixed. So we look at all the facets colored one, and we, we count the number of dots on them. So let's say we have D1 of C dots on facets of color one for C. Then we write X1 to the D1 of C. And likewise, we count the number of dots on facets colored two, and we put X2 to D2 of C and X3 D3 of C. So this is contribution from the observables. And then the more interesting contribution comes from surfaces, Fij bicolored surfaces. That's bicolored. So, so we write x1 
plus x2 to the exponent, the other characteristic of the surface f12, c divided by 2. So, so we take colors 1 and 2, take this linear function, we compute the other characteristic, it's in 2z, divide by 2. So let me actually move this here. So, so that's an integer. And likewise for the other pairs, x1 plus x3, to the x or the characteristic of f13 of c over 2 and 1 more term, x2 plus x3, to the or the characteristic of f23 of c over 2. So this is the variation of a form colored by c. So it can have denominators. If this is positive, you'll have a denominator. If this is negative, this is going to be moved upstairs. So we'll do some examples. I want to say that we're working over a field of characteristic 2 in this case. So plus and minus do not matter. So later, if you put minuses, you can see the relation to the wild character formula in some cases. So, but for now, pluses and minuses don't matter. And we define the variation of C with variation of f to be the sum of the variations of c over all admissible colorings. So take the sum of the variations. Of course, as you change the coloring, uh, surfaces f, i, j, f, c, they can change wildly, and there are other characteristics can change wildly. But there's a theorem that this actually individual terms can have denominators, as we'll see. But uh, the theorem is that this is uh, a polynomial in x1, x2, x3 are symmetric, but it's symmetric under the permutations of indices 1, 2, 3. Uh, so this, this construction is um, a work of Lodri and Robert and myself, about five years old, four, five years old, Lodri and Robert. And uh, the formula was inspired by a more complicated formula by Lodri and Robert. And Emmanuel Wagner around 2017. I'll, I'll talk about that too next time. Um, but for now, it's a very strange formula. Um, so again, we extracting the surfaces, F, I, J, F, C, from a coloring. We're taking their other characteristics and we're inserting them into this formula, this evaluation formula. And, and so, so theorem in particular says that the evaluation of a form is not just a rational function. Um, it's a symmetric function, which is a polynomial. It's very easy to see that it's symmetric in x1, x2, x3, because you have the action of a symmetric group on the set of colorings of the form, and that makes the sum symmetric. But it's more subtle to see that it's a polynomial. But for now, let us do some examples. So any qu questions? So let us take f to be the two sphere, s2, and we put some number of dots on it, number of dots n. This is just to remember that it's a sphere. Uh, what is, so there, there are three possible colorings. Let's say we color the whole sphere by color one. So what's the variation f, uh, call, call this color c1. What's the variation fc1? Well, we should look at the number of dots of each color. There's x1 to the n. There are only dots of color n. We should look at surfaces f12, so f12, c1, f, f13, c1, f23, c1. So again, this is color one. So f12 is a uh, two sphere. As still the other characteristic divided by two is one. f13 is a two sphere. As still this is one. This is empty. This is zero. So the contribution is x1 plus x2 to the other characteristic over 2, so by 1, so and x1 plus x3. So this is the uh, coloring, the variation. Then for f, it's a sum. It's a sum of these three terms over colorings 1, 2, and 3. So you should take this expression and cyclically permute 1, 2, and 3. So it's x, x, i, n over x, i, 
plus xj, xi plus xk, uh, sum over i from 1 to 3, and j and k complementary to i. And you recognize that this is just the complete, complete symmetric function h n minus 2 in variables x1, x2, x3. So a complete symmetric function consists of sum of monomials x1, a1, x2, x2, a2, x3, a3, where a1 plus a2 plus a3 is m, and this is h sub m. And then this is h n minus 2. Uh, so in, in particular, if n is 0, if there, are no, if there is no dots, this evaluates to 0. If there is a dot, it evaluates to 0. If there are two dots, it's 1. If it's three dots, it's x1 plus x2 plus x3, and so on. But it's also so it's a complete symmetric function. So, so it's the character of uh, symmetric power of the fundamental representation of SL3 also. Uh, modulo 2, the coefficients are modulo 2. No questions? Um, um, so another example, let us take a theta form. Let's put some number of dots, n1, n2, and n3 on the three facets. Each facet is a disk. So this is different from this picture. Here I just drew a circle to indicate that it's as S2. Here is a circle. It's this singular circle, sim. So there are three facets with this, ma with this many dots on the facets. Now, colorings, C, they correspond to permutations of 1, 2, 3. So we can color the top by color sigma 1, color the middle facet by sigma 2, color the bottom facet by sigma 3. Now, no matter which f i j you take, j of, of I'll just call sigma, sigma, coloring sigma, uh, it's always S2. So the order characteristic divided by 2 is 1. So it's always the same contribution to the denominator for any coloring. Uh, but the numerator changes because, uh, so the numerator is then, so the evaluation for f and give, given coloring sigma, sigma is an element of S3, is, so it's always x1 plus x2 to this exponent x1 plus x3, x2 plus x3. And here it's x, x coloring is sigma 1, 2 and 1, x sigma 2, 2 exponent n2, and x sigma 3, 2 exponent n3. So this is the variation for a single coloring. So f then is the sum over sigma in S3, uh, in S3. X sigma 1 and 1, X sigma 2 and 2, X sigma 3 and 3 over X1 plus X2, X1 plus X3, x2 plus x3. And so, so that's, you recognize this as the sure function for the permutation, for, for the partition lambda given by this n. So let us assume that n1 is greater than or equal to n2, greater than or equal to n3. And then take the partition n1 minus 2, n2 minus 1, n3. And this is just modular 2, no signs. To have signs, you'll have to put a minus sign and minus sign to the length of sigma here. This is the sure function S lambda for the partition lambda for this n1 and 2 and 3. So it's kind of interesting for that we're counting surfaces. We're looking at their order characteristics for three colors and out. And the evaluation of some of the, one of the simplest forms gives us the 
um, the sure function modulo two, so the character of an irreducible representation of um, SL3, because we have three variables, x1, x2, x3. But so we get the sure function as from this evaluation, sure function S lambda um, in, in, in R, sure function S lambda is the character of V lambda, but so this is mod two. All the coefficients are modular two. Um, if if one of them, if with this condition, if one of, if any two are equal, then you don't get a partition here, but then the evaluation is zero. So for instance, if you have if you're evaluating and you have the same of same number of dots n and n on two such facets with a disk along the circle, then that's zero. And as you see, individual terms are rational functions. They can have denominators of this form, but the whole thing is a polynomial. And it's not hard to prove this theorem that the sum over all, the sum of variations over all colorings is a polynomial. Um, and so again, we borrowed the idea from the work of Robert and Emmanuel Wagner. And we, um, you just pair, so the, issue with making sure that it's a polynomial is to have control over denominators. In the denominator, you can have, say, x1 plus x2. If you have a two-sphere, if you have a two-sphere, because two-sphere has positive order characteristic, two which contributes to a denominator. Because other, other components, like the tori and components of higher genus, they contribute at most to the numerator. So the, the only issue is if you have a two sphere and then it could contribute to the denominator. And then this two sphere, it's part of the surface F12. So if you have such a two sphere, it's part of the F12 surface for a coloring C. So it has some, some pieces may be colored one, some pieces may be colored two. It could also look more complicated. It can have a point where you have this checkerboard one, two, one, two um, point. Um, but so the idea is that if you have such a coloring C, you can form coloring C prime where you just take this particular two sphere and you swap the colors from one to two to two to one. So keep color free as is and keep all the other components as is. Just on this component, swap the colors between one and two. Um, so then you get another coloring C prime. And then if you can look at contributions from FC and FC prime, you'll see that the sum allows you to cancel one X1 plus X2 from the denominator. And then you just have to say it in a uniform way to cancel them all at once. And the result is a polynomial, necessarily symmetric because of the S3 invariance of the sum. So we are able to get rid of denominators in this way. And to every form, we assign, um, we assign an element of the polynomial ring. Again, recall that R is symmetric polynomials. Write them as K, E1, E2, E3. Where these are elementary symmetric polynomials. E1 is X1 plus X2 plus X3. F E2 is X1, X2 plus X1, X3 plus X2, X3. And E3 is X1, X2, X3. Symmetric functions. So maybe quick questions. And so we work in modular two, but if you introduce more data, if you add orientations, add orientations, in the compatible way to the facets, when you can work over Z. So if you were to add compatible orientations by saying that um, orientations is compatible in the sense as they approach a singular, a singular line, um, they must reverse orientation. Um, then um, when you can get, get rid of Z mod 2, you can work with Z, but then for this specific case, for, for three colors specifically, you will not see vertices, which is a very interesting feature of this construction. Can I ask a question? So you mentioned that when we introduce signs, 
question. Yeah. Yeah, so I want to see that, um, of course, the whole thing, I mean, there are lots of and lots of questions here. So let me point out that the, and I'll talk about this more tomorrow, that the original paper of Robert Wagner works, they work over Z. So they have in the end lock of the theta form, which would be a form where you have something of kind of thickness n splitting into something of thickness one and minus one, and keep, keep, keep splitting and then close each piece up using a, using a disk, then they get a wild character formula over Z for GLN, for the, the algebra GLN. This is, this is their paper. But again, it's for very specific form. I don't know if you can see this corner or not. You get specifically GLN. Nobody has explored um, if you can get some combinatorics of representations of GLN for other forms. And, and you can also ask whether the story has a clarification. If we, we are evaluating forms in R3 and we're getting, in particular, characters, and in general, we're getting linear combinations of characters, but we have both plus and minus signs. You can ask if there are some clarification where you, to a form, you would assign a complex of representations, maybe with some additional structure, and then maybe to cobordisms between forms, you'd assign a map, but that's completely open. That would be there's going to be another layer of clarification that's not known. But so for super algebras, there's not much is known, but their work is an important approach to clarification of Schlichten to Reif invariants for quantum GLN. I'll talk about this more. So this, the approach using forms. So if you try to do this for super algebras, that's a very fundamental and mostly open problem because, for instance, the major, the, the famous hager floer homology discovered by um, uh, Oshwet and Zaba. I mean, it has enormous success in the three manifold and four manifold topology. And that homology is more or less a clarification of a representation of this super algebra quantum UQ GL11. But the success in applications to topology was enormous. So going to super case is very important. And I mean, beyond GL11, it's uh, quite open, but completely open. But even GL11 is very hard. So I can, for instance, refer you to a paper of Manion and Ruquet from a couple of years ago, which they kind of more closely work out clarification of GL11 representation in the context of hager floyd theory. But it's a 200-page paper, and it's a very sophisticated paper, and it's not the end of the story. So beyond GL11, there is also a paper of Lev Razansky, and I'm sorry, I forgot the name of his cover, maybe. Um, Richard Rimani, but they have some ideas for how to approach clarification of GLNM. So Razansky, Rimani, Oblomkov. So there are some development in that direction. So the denominators, they're, they're just the x1, xi plus or minus xj. If, if you're doing this over z, over z, then you, you need to well, you need to order the indices. You need to order indices, let's say, one, two, three. And so you need to keep that order. And then you'll have a sign, minus one. And the sign is complicated. So in, and I'll talk about this. I mean, I'll say this tomorrow. But the sign, there's additional complicated sign to do it over Z. But in terms of the denominator, that says that only the GN type show up. Sorry, in terms of the wild denominator? Yeah, if you want to interpret this as a wild character formula, yes. Yeah, this is only in time, but so people have been thinking about BN case and DN case. Um, so, for instance, a student at Columbia, Murdul Vata, she has um, very interesting ideas for how to do the B2 case, how to clarify B2 case using forms. So she doesn't have a complete answer, but she, for instance, understands these formulas in a special case when you don't have single lines, you have just surfaces. So you have a TQFT, but she has two TQFTs, one for four-dimensional representation, one for five-dimensional representation. And, it's, and then it's, it's much more complicated version, combinatorially complicated version of this, of this story. And that's work in progress. And I know that people have looked at it very hard, so that it's a difficult problem. And several teams, I would say, are working on this. But it's very subtle. So it's, because most of the work in quantum topology and on quantum invariance of three manifolds, you know, it's about uh, nodes. It's about doing this in one dimension lower. When you don't have surfaces, you, 
when you have a graph of intertwiners of quantum group in the plane, and you evaluating it, so you're doing some kind of counting over colorings of that intertwiner graphs so of coloring of edges such that something that is in you're counting some configurations. And in the simplest cases, you'll be cal cal counting circles, like in the Penrose counting formula, you counting some circles with some weights. So this is going one dimension up, going one dimension up, counting, counting surfaces in R3 rather than certain configurations in the plane. And I think the connection to physics is completely open. For instance, possible connection to statistical mechanics, I think that's a very interesting question. Is there some model in 3D which mirrors this computation? Some statistical model in 3D where you have to take, you have to pull out the surfaces from the model and they can contribute their own characteristics to the, to the, um, to the evaluation formula to the partition function. I think that's completely open, and I think that's a very interesting question. Yeah, so I don't keep track of time. I don't know if there's a, a, a clock. Eight, of course, uh, we still have uh, at least 20 minutes. Uh -huh. Yeah, let, so let me continue. So what's the next step? So we got these numbers that, again, have not been explored as much as would have been nice to explore. Uh, but what to do beyond this? So the next step is the universal construction. Construction is an idea um, uh, from a paper, I think it's 1995, by uh, Christian Blanchet, Haberger. Uh, Christian is here in the audience. Um, Haberger, um, Masbaun and Vagel. Um, and we use this idea a lot in link homology, and I think it's also starting to catch up outside <coughs> of link homology. So let me explain the idea. Um, so suppose you have some evaluation like um, uh, setup. So for instance, in our example, we to a closed form, to, to closed form. So these forms are closed in the sense that they don't have boundary. Later you'll have forms with boundaries. So to closed, <coughs> to closed form, we f we assign a number um, evaluation of f, an element of some commutative ring. Let's now take a commutative ring, R which is specific ring in our case. But let, let's say that, just imagine that in general, you may, maybe you have manifolds in some dimension, and to these manifolds you assign numbers, elements of the field, or community ring. Um, and you'd like to build a TQFT. You'd like to build state spaces for um, objects in one dimension less. So how do you do that? Um, for this variation, let us also impose the condition that it's multiplicative. So the variation of a disjoint union is the product of variations. But so this this is more general. We can we can put in manifolds or manifolds with decorations, whatever you want. But let me state it in case of forms. So in case of forms, so let's say you have a have some form. Um, so given this association, closed objects to numbers, um, we can build state spaces for cross sections. So cross section would be take this object, cut it by a hyperplane to get an object in one less dimension. In this picture, we can cut and see a graph, a trivalent graph in the plane. Of course, we can bend, we can bend the form and do another cross section, it's gonna be a different graph. So there are many possibilities. So given such a graph gamma, so we, we kind of, the idea is that we, we see what happens from the start to the end, we get this number, but we'd like to build a model for what happens inside. So we'd like to build vector spaces or state spaces modules for these graphs. So it's, in some sense, it's a very applied question. You have, you have a data, you want to build a model for what happens inside, and our model's gonna be minimal, the most, most efficient. Um, okay, so how do, we, how do we build state spaces? To a graph gamma, we want to build bracket of gamma uh, state space. space which is a module over R, or module. So let us do as follows. So take a graph, or graph gamma is in the plane, and it's trivalent. If you take a form, take a generic cross-section, take a generic cross-section, you see a trivalent graph. 
So genetically, you don't encounter these vertices. So let us, um, let us first, as intermediate step, we build a free object where we look at all forms with boundary gamma. So this is one such example. So again, we can have dots. dots. So we look at the form F. Now we have boundary. The boundary of F is gamma. And let us take the free module. Free module on gamma is just a free R module with basis. Basis. I'm going to, to each such form, I'll assign its symbol, bracket F, just formal symbol. But there are countably many such forms. But they could be very complicated. You can, I mean, you can also allow pieces that float, that float, the closed pieces, they won't matter, but you can allow them if you want. Now, on, on this free module, we have a bilinear form as follows. Free module gamma cross free module of gamma into the ground ring R. So take, let's say this is F1, and let us pick F2, a form that bounds gamma, bless you. So let us take and glue them together along gamma. So fl flip one to the other side and glue them together. We'll get a picture like so this is F2. And we flip F1 to the other side. And this is F1 bar. Oh, F1 bar. Now we can take, so our bilinear form takes the symbol of F1, symbol of F2, glues them together into F1 bar F2, and we apply our irradiation bracket of that closed form to get an element of R. And so this is our bilinear form. And in, in this bilinear form is symmetric. Again, this is, it's completely general. It goes, goes way beyond formed and way beyond using this particular ring R. Whenever you have uh, closed objects, in this case, you can build state spaces for cross sections. So if you want to say it more explicitly, you'd say, I have, um, <coughs> excuse me, I have a monoidal category. So you can, so now we're talking, we're talking about cobordisms, right? So we have cross sections as objects and forms with boundaries cobordisms. Um, but at first, we started with closed forms. So to say this in the language of cobordisms, um, in the category of cobordisms, so we had the variations for closed cobordisms, so for endomorphisms of the identity object, of the identity and minus one manifold. And from these variations, we build a vector space. We build a vector space, the vector space is um, a state space bracket of gamma given by the quotient the free space, free module of gamma, modulo the kernel of the bilinear form. This bilinear form depends on gamma. So it's this bilinear form, gamma. Oops. Gamma. So define this as our kind of main object, this state space of, of the graph gamma. It's the quotient of the free space on gamma by the kernel of the bilinear form. And this can be done in high generality. We can do this in any monoidal category, starting with analogs of closed forms are going to be endomorphisms of the identity object. You start with nothing, you end with nothing, so that's endomorphisms of the identity object in the monoidal category. So given such a map, such a variation into elements of a community free, you can then build state spaces for, for objects, for objects. Okay, now how do you go from here? So you have the state spaces. Again, if you randomly pick, if you were to randomly pick an evaluation, you will not get anything interesting because the element, so what's the condition for a linear combination? So what's the condition for a linear combination? Some lambda i bracket of fi um, to be zero, so you have some, I'll just schematically draw this as gamma and schematically draw this as 
fi. So what's the condition for this to be zero? This means that means that for any for any f that bounds gamma, if you take fi um, glue to f bar, um, evaluate and multiply by lambda i, sum over i, this should this is zero. So that's a huge number of conditions because this should hold no matter how you cap it off, no matter which form f you use. So that's lots of conditions. So if your evaluation were random, then typically you'd have no relations. Typically your kernel would be trivial. So the state space is going to be very large. And that's the case you want to avoid. So you're interested in the case when you have lots of relations and this is small, for instance, you would want the rank of this module to be finite as a module over R. Also, let me explain why this is a topological theory, but it's not a TQFT in general. Uh, so let's say you have a cabordism. So you have um, have graph gamma null, say for form, have graph gamma one, and you have a form between them. So given form f whose boundary is is if you ignore your orientations, you don't have to put a minus sign. But normally you'd put normally you'd put a minus sign. But ignoring orientation, so the boundary of f is a gamma null union gamma one. Then uh, such an f gives you a map. So first off, f gives you a map from the free module for gamma null to the free module for gamma one. Because you can um, how does it work? So a basis element here is given by given by a form whose boundary is gamma null by some form f null. So this map will take this form this map takes the symbol of this form to the symbol. The only thing we can do is we can compose f null with f because they have the same boundaries. So F0 goes to the symbol of F, F0 in here. And you can check out this respect to the quotient map, this quotient by the kernel. So this induces a map on the state space, state space of gamma null to the state space of gamma one. And that's the map we call bracket of, bracket of F. So given the cabordism f, between those graphs we get an induced map on state spaces, gamma null, gamma one. And again, this is for forms, but this works in general in the universal construction. So we necessarily get those maps. But why is it not, a, not necessarily a TQFT? Uh, and of course, the composition responds to composition. So you get a functor from the from form cabordisms from forms, forms as cabordisms between uh, between planar graphs, planar trivial graphs. So you get a functor into the category of R modules. Um, so what is what, what happens when in general in general if you look at the state space of the disjoint union gamma null union gamma one then you have a map from the tensor product of state spaces state space for gamma null tensor state space for gamma one as follows you take your gamma null you take your graph gamma one so you have a form F, F null that bounds gamma null. You have a form F1 that bounds gamma one. 
and you map them to the disjoint union F0, union F1, because it now bounds gamma 1. So the map takes F0 tensor F1 into the, into the symbol of the un disjoint union. And of course, in the TQFT, so we have this map. And this map is an isomorphism for TQFTs. So it's one of the axioms of TQFTs. But here, what sometimes happens is that uh, in general case, if you take not necessarily forms, not just some community free R, then what often happens is that this map is on the injective, uh, but not surjective, because you can have something you may have something with boundary gamma null union gamma one, union gamma one, that doesn't come from such tensor products. So you can have a, a picture here with a schematic. Schematic, you can have an element that's not that's not the sum lambda i, something which bounds gamma null, something which bounds gamma um, gamma one. So this is more Some people sometimes call this a lex, lex TQFT, and we call it topological theory. So in fact, for, 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 for forms, actually, we don't know for this particular case if you have an isomorphism for, for all graphs. That's, that's not known. And we don't know, in fact, we don't know whether for any graph, this is a free module or a projective module over R. Um, uh, but for, but so the first case that we don't know is the graph of the decahedron. Yeah. So it's a monoidal functor from some cobordism category to some linear category. Yeah. Yes. And I mean, clearly, the historically first definition was, as you're saying, that uh, that the monoidal structure on the cobordism category was given by disjoint union. But this is not the best definition. This is what we see, for example, new example. So why don't we modify the definition of TQFT instead of? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't want to be in charge of you know, changing. I mean, changing my boards. It would but be yeah, nice. Yeah. I think yeah. you, you, you should do this. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, we will have for for yeah, for, for, for yeah. centuries this discussion. What is a TQFT? Yeah, but we can. I'm just happy to call it a lax TQFT. But I think when people say lax TQFT, they mean something very similar. People call lax TQFT, or I would call it topological theory. But maybe a more conventional name is a lax TQFT. But I definitely don't want to be the one deciding that this is, this, is, this is the new official definition of TQFT. I don't think anyone wants to be a monoidal functor. Monoidal functor. Oh, but, it's, but it's weak. Yeah, it's weak monoidal because this functor, this functor, it's not, you see, it's, it's not monoidal because the functor on the union. But you know, if this is just modules, modules over community freeing, I mean, there is not that many monoidal structures on that category. It's just the usual tensor product. So I, I don't think so. So I think lex, either of this is fine, lex TQFT or topological fee is fine. So I'll put some pieces of the boundary and I will take connected sum instead of disjoint union. This is much nicer category and you will not have all these issues. I see. So there's an, you're saying there's another natural monoidal structure yeah. on the so cobordism category. Yeah, this is, this is what, what my point of view. But nice. okay. uh, so sorry, how much time do I have? Um, about 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, so, so what we get is, uh, let me just stick to either, either one of these terms, lexic EFT or topological theory. So we get a functor from weakly, weakly monoidal functor from, um, um, from cobordisms to, to modules over R. So what do we know about this particular functor? So, so let me actually just state, state some other properties. So 
So naive conjecture, naive conjecture, so we don't have any faith in this conjecture, is that um, for any for any trivial on planar graph gamma, the state space of gamma is a free is a free R module of rank equal to the number of tight colorings of gamma. So tight colorings of gamma for a planar trivial on graph gamma is the number of ways to color the edge, colorings the assign, uh, colorings of edges into three colors such that every vertex the colors are distinct. And in fact, our admissible colorings were well, liftings kind of of tight colorings one dimension up. We were coloring forms and not trivial on graphs. But so naive conjecture is that for any gamma, this is a free module of rank number of tight colorings of gamma. So we have a proposition that this conjecture holds holds for reducible graphs. graphs. Yeah, and at this, at this point, it connects to the four color theorem. But so proposition says it holds for reducible graphs. So a graph is reducible if you can um, you can simplify it as follows. If it has a, just a loop, uh, you can you can you can you can remove the loop from the graph. If it has if it has um, if it has a loop like this, then you can just this is a loop with no vertices. If it has a loop with one vertex, you can just kind of forget about the, gra the graph. If it has a face with two sides, you can reduce to this graph. If it has a face with three sides, you can reduce to this graph. And if it has a face with four sides, you can reduce to two graphs, this graph and this graph. And then keep reducing the sets of graphs. And if at the end you can always get to the just unions of empty graphs, then that's a reducible graph. And for that graph, the conjecture holds. Uh, and then, in fact, things are strongly multiplicative. So this is, in fact, an isomorphism. An isomorphism if, um, if one, one of them is reducible. So how do you prove something like this? Well, you derive scaling relations on this on, on, in this theory. Uh, so, for instance, well, if, if you have if you have a graph like this, um, well, graph graph gamma. So you want to understand the claim that the state space of gamma is zero. So if you have this gamma, so to understand the state space of gamma, what do we do? We look at all the forms, all the forms f that bound gamma. This is the span of our state space. Um, now we pair it up against forms that bound gamma and compute the variation. But for this particular gamma, um, there are no colorings. So that means that for any forms f1, f2 bar, the variation of f2 bar, f1, is zero, just because there's no coloring. Because you have a facet which comes to this seam from two sides. So that's zero, but this means that the state space of gamma is zero, because the bilinear forms are identically zero. So um, state space is zero. Um, and there are no, also no like, tight colorings. Now for, for this, um, to, to show this reduction, you check that the state space of this graph is isomorphic to two copies of the state space of the simplified graph. And to construct this isomorphism, you set up cobordisms. You set up forms back and forth. So let me draw this here. So, so, so it turns out that you have the following relation. So if you take, um, if you look at this form, and you can think of this form as sort of identity map from this graph to itself, then this form decomposes as the sum.
of these two forms. So we're going to draw um, this graph and two copies of the simplified graphs and four maps, maps back and forth between them. Um, so for instance, this map would be given by take um, this half of the map So the, this caborism is a, is a caborism from this form, from a line to this form. Um, so going back is the opposite one. And likewise for this uh, story. So you get this, this graph, two copies of this graph, and four cobordisms between them. And then you can check that you get a direct some decomposition in the sphere. So that, for instance, going there and back is one, is identity. So, so that means that if you draw, if you have this bubble on the, on, the, on the plane and you have a dot on the facet, that's, you can just reduce it to identity. So this is identity, uh, this is identity. You can check that this composition is a zero, this composition is a zero, and then this plus this is identity. And the last relation is, says here that this identity is the composition, this with this, and this with this. So you get a direct sum decomposition. So you, the state space of this is the sum of two copies of the state space of this. So as long as you understand this state space, you understand the state space, and that tells you the part of the result here. And so there are similar reductions for other graphs. But the, you get stuck once, you get stuck if you have pentagons on the and higher valency facets, then we get stuck. So the first graph that you don't know about is the dodecahedral dot graph, gamma d, so dodecahedron when we don't know the size of the state space. And I think I'm out of time, so maybe I'll briefly, next time I'll briefly say the relation to the four color theorem and to the work of Kronheim and Rovka. So this is, but this is the graph, and um, the smallest graph for which we don't know the answer, we don't know the size of the state space, and we don't know, for instance, if you take two of these graphs, whether this map is going to be an isomorphism. So we don't know whether the identity cobordism from this graph to itself, when you bend it to be cobordism from nothing to two copies of the graph, whether it decomposes as a sum of cobordisms on the two sides. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Questions for Mikhail? Further questions? Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so, so right, so this reduction, this, this reduction rules. Yeah, so why, just repeat the question, why, why we cannot reduce the pentagon? So in this case, um, well, in, in each of these cases, in this case, we're just the state space is zero, but in other cases, you can reduce the state space of the graph on the left to, to a sum of, state spaces of the graphs on the right. So for instance, st state space here will be a sum of state spaces of these two graphs. State space here is a sum of two copies, two copies of the state space of this graph. So you have full control of this reduction. So if you have a, if you have a pentagon, of course you have simpler graphs. You can draw simpler graphs with the same set of five endpoints, but they, they, they're, they're, we don't see maps back and forth that would give us a direct sum decomposition like like this, so, but it's an open question. Maybe there is some way to enhance these graphs and add some add some more, more complexity to get such decompositions. That's you can, for instance, ask if there is some enhancement, some refinement where you have graph plus something else that will give you give you a reduction. That's a good question. But this is completely open, and the complexity right now the complexity seems high to understand what's going on in the non in the non reducible case starting from. This one. And work here has been done by David Boozer, who is at Princeton. So he wrote some, he did coding to, to get some bounds on the sizes of rings on this group. So there are kind of more to the story because you work over the ring of symmetric functions and three variables. So you can take quotients into PIDs 
and those are easier to understand. Uh, but the hardest case is when you take a quotient by killing all the axes, making them zero, and that relates to Kronheim Morovka theory for three orbifolds, which is some gauge theory for three orbifolds, which was one of the motivations for this work. And the whole thing relates to the four color theorem because the four color theorem says that if you have a planar traveling graph, then as long as it's not bad, as long as it doesn't have a bridge, then it has a it has a four it has a tight coloring. You can you can relabel four colorings of regions into tight colorings of edges. Okay, I think uh, a lot of questions were asked during the lecture, which is great. So let's thank uh, Mikhail thank again for the very nice lecture. Thank you.